This is a summary of everything about limits and continuity. So summary videos are meant to tie all of the material together and I will quickly go through many topics and examples. So this is a great thing to watch after you've kind of worked through everything with limits. You might realize after watching this, there are some concepts you, you don't fully grasp and that's totally normal with limits. So if that happens um, and you want a more in-depth explanation, so you'd rather hear kind of the explanation at a slower pace or more in-depth, you can check out the description of this video and I have linked kind of all the topics I'm covering in this. I, I cover them at a much slower in-depth pace in, in other, other videos. And yes, that is my shameless self-promotion. It really helps me out when you guys watch my videos. Now, just a warning, this will be a bit longer than usual. Usually I shoot for my videos to be like around um, 20 minutes. I think this one's probably gonna go over just cause there's so much content in it and I am gonna go through examples. Now, I highly recommend using my guided notes and I will drop a link to those in the description of this video or you can go to my website, divideandconquermath.com. So I recommend this because I think sometimes when you watch longer videos, it can be really boring um, and your brain will kind of just want to start going other places. So my guided notes are kind of there to help you kind of engage with the video and, and stay on track. So if you find that sometimes your, your mind starts wandering, I highly recommend getting those. Now just a warning, this video is just a summary to help get you started with studying. When preparing for a test, nothing beats practice on your own. Now, if you are looking for more actual practice, I have a series where I have created problem sets that you can try and then I do all the problems, um, but you have to absolutely just do problems by yourself. You, there is no amount of videos that you can watch that are ever going to make you good at calculus if you don't just do it by yourself and practice, practice, practice by yourself. Okay, so starting with limits, just quick overview with the notation. So this is kind of like the, the basic notation for limits or this is usually what we think of. So this first one, so this is talking about a limit that's approaching this point A from both sides. And then these other two, so this one is what's known as a right-handed limit and this one's known as a left-handed limit. So just to kind of briefly remind you, what does that even mean? I have this little graph here, so you can, you can jot this down in your notes if you want to use this. Otherwise, you can pause the video here just to make sure you kind of remember this. So I just want to figure out what's the limit on the right versus the limit on the left and then the limit approaching from both sides. So maybe you want to pause here, figure this out, and then hit play. Okay, so starting with A here, so, or, so this first one, so A approaching from the right. So I've talked about this in other videos, but the way I think about this is, so here is my point A. So let me just kind of draw a line going through this. So really you have the left and the right side of A. Now I can never remember a lot of times, or I, I have the memory of a hamster, so I, I have trouble sometimes remembering do I go from the left or for the right? But what instead I think of this as is, is the more positive side. So which side of A is more positive, this side or this side? This side is the more positive side, so this is the side that I want to be approaching. So here I am on this side of the graph, and it looks like my limit is approaching this point here, so this would be negative three. So this would be the value as we approach from the right. Then as I approach on the left, so this is the more negative side. So again, if I think about this as kind of my, my dividing line, so if I'm on this side, this means I'm gonna be on this part of the graph, and this looks like I'm approaching one, so this equals one. And then the limit as um, x approaches b, so this is now, this gotta exist from both sides. So I can see from the left and from the right that they're both approaching the same point three, so this will just be three. So there's just kind of a, a quick reminder of kind of how that works. Now, there are many limit laws that make evaluating a limit quick and easy. A lot of times limits can be super easy to calculate actually. So I'm just gonna very briefly show you, I'm not even gonna talk through all these, but if you wanna pause the video and write these down, you can go for it. There are a ton of limit laws that make calculating limits much easier, so I'll just show them to you. So we've got the sum rule and the difference rules. So that means if you're adding or subtracting two limits, um, then the value of those limits, you can just add or subtract. We've got um, the constant multiple rule. So if I have some function times a constant, I can just take the value, the, the limit of that function times that constant. If I'm multiplying um, two functions together and I know the limits, I can just multiply the two limits together. Um, we've got the quotient rule, so that's talking about if I have, if I'm dividing two functions, 
and I know the limits, I can just divide their two limits. Um, I've got the power rule. So this one I think is very helpful. If you've got some function and you know the value of it and then you're taking it to this exponent m, you just take that limit to the nth power. And the same thing works with roots. So I've got that there. We also have two theorems that make calculating certain limits very straightforward. So this one is the limits of polynomials. So if you have a polynomial, the limit of it is found by just plugging in whatever that limit, limit is approaching. So if, if the limit as x approaches c of this polynomial, just plug in c. That's it. So this makes this super straightforward. And then we also have the limits of rational functions. So if you have two functions, so p of x and q of x, these are polynomials. So it's the same idea, right? So the limit as x approaches c of this limit can be found by just plugging in c. Now, this is provided that plugging that in does not create a zero in the denominator. When that happens, you have to do some other things, and, and we'll discuss that in a moment. So now that we've discussed that, I also want to discuss the idea of continuity. Limits and continuity really go together, so let's review just the ideas behind continuity. So I've got these two graphs here. So this one, is this continuous? It is not, right, because it has that break. What makes a graph continuous? Just like intuitively, we know it's just got to be like this smooth um, curve with no breaks in it. Now, from a calculus perspective, what makes something continuous is that at a point c, a function is continuous at c if the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals f of c, i.e. if when you plug in that value of c that's equal to the limit, that's what makes it continuous. Now, we also have the idea of right continuous. And so here you can see as the limit is approaching on the right of f of x, this equals f of c. So this actually matters, and I have this little graph here just to kind of break this down. So if you think about this, so here's here's from the right, right? So this exists, and, and if I just plug in the value of c, that's, that's literally what the, the, the limit value is equal to. But notice on the left, there, there would not equal this value. Now, another way that this type of graph could present itself, though, is maybe this graph actually is discontinuous. I could have another piece of the graph like this. So this graph has a limit as x approaches c on the left and on the right, but it's only right continuous because this closed dot here is kind of what's indicating that it's, it's right continuous. So if this doesn't make sense, I highly recommend that you check out my video on continuity because I've, I've broken this down in much more depth. Again, I'm just kind of going through the, the high level points here. And then left continuous would mean um, if I'm approaching from the left, I should just be able to plug in that value of c on the left. Now, one thing that comes up when you talk about continuity is that these three things have to all um, be true. So your value at f of c has to exist, the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists, and then these two things are equal. Again, if that's confusing, highly recommend you just check out the continuity video, video where I break that down a little bit more. Now. If you have continuous functions composed with one another, then the limits are actually very straightforward to calculate. So we have this great little thing called the limits of compositions of continuous functions. So if I know that I have these two um, functions, so f of x and g of x, and I know that they're both continuous, then calculating their limits is really just as simple as I calculate the limit of f of x, and then I just plug that into g. So it makes it very, very straightforward. It basically allows you just to plug in one value and then just kind of start evaluating. So when you know that you've got something that is continuous, you can really just start plugging in limits. But continuity is also related to the, the limits. So they're, they're kind of like a, a tricky, tricky thing um, sometimes. But if you know that they're continuous, then you can kind of just use this. Now what I want to do is, I, I've t been talking a lot, I want to put all this together just for a few examples. So I have these three examples here that kind of piggyback off of everything that we've just talked about so far. Classic examples in my opinion. If you want to pause the video to try these, I highly recommend it. So with this first one, so this is exactly what I was talking about with these being continuous functions. I know that sine e and x plus 1, so there are really three functions being composed here, this one, this one, and this one, and they're all continuous. So what that allows me to do then is I can actually very quickly evaluate this limit. So what I can do is I can just take e to the negative 1 plus 1. So I can just go ahead and evaluate these and just kind of plug and chug here. So this really just becomes e to the 0 
e to the 0 is just going to be equal to 1. And then sine of 1, this is just either a, a decimal value or you could just leave it as sine of 1. If you were to plug it into a calculator, you'd get um, 0.8415. I would probably just leave it as sine of one because um, you know you could just evaluate that but that's going to be some some wacky number okay so moving on to B here so I wanted to compare these two limits so these are one-sided limits and this is actually requiring that you know a little bit about the square root function so if you think about the domain of a square root function the value under the square root has to be zero or greater so if you think about this then so two from the left so this would be where. So if you're if you're thinking about kind of um, numbers to maybe compare this to, these would be numbers just under two that you could kind of think about. So if I look at this and I think about a number just under two, this is actually going to create a negative value under the square root. So this this does not exist. And if you think about the graph of this, which might make this even easier. So the graph of this function looks like this. So you can see that on the left side of two, this graph does not exist. So on the left, we would actually say since, you know, two on the left does not really exist, this whole thing does not exist. But on the right, this does exist, right? And this would just equal zero. Now for this last one, I've detailed a lot of limits like this, but these are really good limits just to test your understanding of one-sided limits. So I'll drop a link to more examples like this if this is not totally clear. But in this case, so we're talking about being at one on the right, that is on the positive side of our absolute value. So because of that, I can actually just simplify this and rewrite my absolute value function as being on the positive side. Now, if I were on the other side of one, then I would have to make this function negative. So you do want to make sure you understand that. If that doesn't make sense, then maybe watch some other videos. And the reason that we like this is then I can cancel these out. I cannot just cancel out the absolute value as is. These two are not equivalent at the moment, but because I know that I'm approaching this from the right, I can rewrite this value as this. So again, check out one of my, val my videos on absolute value if you're not sure. So then all I have to do with this is really just plug one into this, this becomes one minus two, so this will equal negative one, and boom, we're done. Now, what should you do if you have a zero in the denominator or zero over zero? So we, we kind of already played with this in the last example, but I, I wanna highlight this a little bit more here. When you have either a zero in the denominator or zero over zero, you should try other tricks. Do not be so quick to say, oh, I've got zero over zero, I've got zero in the denominator, oh, I don't have to go any farther. Usually that is indicative that you have to do a lot more work to the limit and the limit is actually gonna be a bit harder. Now, you should never ever write that zero over zero equals one or zero over zero equals zero. This is known as the indeterminate form and you are gonna be instantly wrong on an exam if that is all you do. Zero over zero equals either one of those results and you don't try anything else, that is incorrect. And more importantly, I will cry if you write zero over zero equals one. That is like one of the mistakes in calculus that just drives me crazy. This is not even factually true. So do not write it, keep it in mind. It is never get desperate and write that. Do something else, do anything else. Now, I wanna review a couple of algebraic tricks to try for our limits. And these are for our finite limits. So uh, X is going to some, some value right now. So things that you can do, you can try factoring and canceling. So if I have like a problem like this, so I can go ahead and just factor the top and bottom and then I would cancel out the X plus ones. Another thing you could try is you could try multiplying by the conjugate. So I have this little example here. So this would give me zero over zero. And so what I would do then is I would multiply by the conjugate, which is found by just flipping this sign here. And then I would work all that out. Another thing you could try is you could try simplifying a complex fraction. So I have this problem here. So again, this is gonna give me zero over zero. So what I would, what I would wanna do in this case is I would wanna clear the denominators. So if you aren't sure of how those details work, again, I have plenty of videos where I detail all of that. This is just a summary. Now, um, right, other tricks include this limit here. So this one can come up a lot. Some calculus classes cover this, some don't. I talk about this in my calculus class. 
this is one that, that comes up a lot, at least if you're in my class. Also another trick to use is the sandwich theorem. So um, I've got that listed here if you want to pause and read it. Your last ditch effort, if you really can't figure out the limit, is to make a table of values as you get closer and closer to the limit. But I want to say that you should only do this if you're completely unsure or you really can't make anything else work. A lot of times making a table will not be accepted in calculus classes. Um, usually th this is not considered to be analytical. So if they say to um, analyze, um, calculate the limit analytically, this is not analytically. This is just kind of looking at a pattern and seeing what it looks like it's approaching. Now, if you're really stuck and you, you think that your limit maybe doesn't work, this can be a good way to kind of figure that out. And tables do get used in certain applications, but everything that we've talked about so far, tables usually are not used and not preferred. Now, uh, we'll pause here again. I'll just give you a second to kind of think about these three. Again, if you want to pause, try these, um, I'll go through them. Okay, so starting with this first example. So notice if I plug in four, I'm gonna get zero over zero. So this is exactly what I was just talking about with multiplying by the conjugate. So I can go ahead and just do this. And so let me work this out real quick. Okay, so I wanna point out something that I did in how I, I analyzed this. So this, this kind of is a little bit of luck here, but with the way that this particular limit is designed, I didn't multiply out the bottom because I was kind of hoping that one of these factors here would drop out. So I just left this as Oops, and I just realized I made a mistake. These should be square roots, my bad. Um, so I just left this as is, and I don't multiply it together because notice what happens when I multiply out the top. Well, these square roots drop out, so I'm just left with x minus four, and then I can cancel these factors out here, which was exactly what I wanted to have happen. And now I can go ahead and evaluate this limit as shown. So this will just come out then to one over two plus two, so that's just one over four. Okay, so for B here, so I'm going to go ahead and, and factor, so let me go ahead and set that up. And now you can see actually in this one, so these x squared minus ones can't cancel out. So this limit becomes nice and easy peasy. So I can just plug in one now to get two. Now, one thing I do want to point out here, notice how my limit notation stays consistent until I actually evaluate the limit. So once I plug in numbers, I am no longer going to need the limit notation, but otherwise I always have to have that limit notation there. Okay, now this last one, this is going to require that we use that limit as x approaches zero of sine of theta over theta equals one. So um, to set this up, the first thing that you're going to want to do, and, and you know this by the way, because if you plug in zero, you get zero over zero. And there's no other way to really simplify this. So now we have to go ahead and set this up. So let's see, this I will rewrite this as sine of three x over cosine of three x. And then I've got this other one over x, so this x in the denominator, I just broke this out into its own thing. Okay, so to use this, we know that we have to have this sine of three x over the x. So I'll go ahead and put those together. And then I'll put the one over cosine of three x over here. Now I can't use this theorem yet because these things are not the same. This is three x here, this is an x here. So what I'm gonna do then, and I've talked about this in other videos, is I'm gonna multiply the top and bottom by three. And so what that allows me to do then is this part right here now is good to go and I can use this theorem here. So the way that this will work out then is this will give me three times this whole little circle here is gonna be one and then this will be times one over, so cosine of zero is just one. So here's everything I'm gonna to multiply together and I get three. Now, I know I went through that really quickly um, so again, if you're just realizing, oh, I, I don't totally remember this, I have plenty of videos on this. This is just, again, quick summary refresher. Now let's take a look at a couple other different types of limits. So first I want to start about, I want to talk about limits that go to positive or negative infinity. So limits that are kind of of this form right here. 
Now, before I go any farther, if you've been watching and you've enjoyed this video so far, please consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel, sharing this with your friends, or leaving a comment. I am trying very hard to provide quality math help to all, and whenever you kind of give me that feedback, it really helps me to keep going and making more resources like this. Okay, so back to infinite limits. All of the limit laws still apply, the ones that we talked about at the beginning of this, but the evaluation strategy for these limits is a little bit different. Now, one of the key facts to remember is that the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x equals 0. This is a key fact. Now, I'll show you the graph real quick. So this is the graph of 1 over x, and so you can see, so here's x going to infinity, that's this way. So it's getting really, really close to this axis down here. And by the way, there's somebody mowing in my lawn right now. They just started as I'm in the middle of this video, so sorry if you can hear that. Okay, so this is kind of a key fact to remember, and you can see also if you were to go to the negative infinity direction, this would also equal zero. So if you can remember this, then th this can apply to a lot of other areas. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna review other common tricks just right in the examples. So let's get started with this first limit here. So I've got the limit as x approaches negative infinity of this crazy thing. Now, this is a rational expression, and so, or yeah, this is rational, so you've got one polynomial over another. And the thing that you really wanna notice here is what is the dominating term? And by dominating term, I mean, what variable has the highest exponent? So that is here in the numerator. And so if you just kind of think about this for a second, that means that the highest thing is on top. So this thing is just gonna grow like crazy. So in this particular example, this is going to end up going to either positive or negative infinity. We can't quite tell, but it could go to negative infinity because the whole limit is going to x, uh, x, x is approaching negative infinity. So what do you do? How do you figure this out? Well, one trick that we use, particularly with rational expressions like this, is we divide everything by the highest term in the denominator, i.e. we're gonna divide everything by x over three. So let me go ahead and set that up. So as you can see, I went ahead and I divided everything by x to the third, and then I just went ahead and simplified that. And so what this allows us to do now is we can really easily see what's kind of going on here. So anything that's over the x, all of these things are all going to zero. And uh, let's see, oops, this was supposed to be 4x, 4 over x cubed. So all of these two are going to zero. Um, this will end up going to eight right here. So the, the big thing that we're left with though, and, and the thing that we really care about are, are these two terms here. So this 4x in comparison to x to the fourth, this is still the dominating term. But now I can kind of see, you know, when we simplify this and, and look at this in a new lens, we're really thinking about what happens to this as we go to negative infinity and, and we're taking this to the fourth power. So anything that you take to an even power is going to end up becoming positive. So it would be wrong. Uh, let, let me clear a little space. Okay. So it would be wrong if we wrote negative infinity to the fourth. Now, I think it depends a little bit on the teacher, but a lot of times teachers don't want to see this. And it's because infinity is not a number, so you, you cannot just inherently plug it in. So again, it depends on the teacher, but a lot of teachers are not okay with writing that. So you kind of have to then just think about what actually happens though. Like this is what's happening in your mind. So I'll just say maybe in our head, here's kind of what we're thinking about negative infinity to the fourth. So anything to this even power is going to end up becoming positive, right? So this ends up equaling infinity. So I know that this is kind of what's happening, but I don't wanna just plug this in and say, oh, this, this is what this kind of shakes out to. So you have to decide what's the best way to represent that, kind of de dependent on you know the, the teacher that you have. But this is really what's kind of happening here. This x to the fourth is dominating the rest of this and when you take this negative thing to the fourth power, it becomes positive. So the final answer here is positive infinity, and that is why. Okay, so moving on to B here. So this is also a rational expression in disguise. Sometimes this throws people off because we get the square root here. But really at the end of the day, 
x squared minus 4 and x minus 3. These are like this would make a, a rational expression. So this square root is just a little consequence and we'll deal with it in a moment. Now, one of the key things that you have to think about though with these square roots is what's happening when you take the square root of this dominating term. So if I just think about what happens as I take the square root of x squared, this really just comes out to acting like x, right? And this is important because thinking about kind of how these, these are going to interact with one another, this helps me to figure out what I can divide by because I still want to use this trick of dividing by the, the term of the highest power. So in this case, um, since I know, like I said, this, this really just comes out to an x on top, I can divide everything by x, but we want to be a little more careful with this. So sometimes when you have these rational expressions, you have to be a little sneaky with how you are dividing things in. So what I'm going to have here is this x squared minus 4, and I'm going to divide all of this by x squared. And then down here, I'm going to divide these parts by x. Now, I want you just to think about this. What is the square root of x squared? It is just x. So I'm actually dividing this entire problem just by x, but I had to manipulate it here. Now, I've detailed this a lot more in some of my other videos, so if you want a deeper explanation of that, consider checking one of those out. So now if I just think about what happens then as I divide by that square root, this is going to give me x squared over x squared, and this will be 4 over x squared, and this bottom will simplify to 1 minus 3 over x. So let's see, I'll continue over here. So this will really turn into then 1 minus 4 over x squared, and then in the denominator we've got 1 over 3x. So this is great because now I know this and this, these are both going to zero. So now I can evaluate this limit and say this really comes down to the square root of one over one. So this just equals one and that would be the value of this particular limit. So I have more tricky limits like this that are kind of like rational expressions but require just a, a, a little bit of more clever thinking. And I'll drop some links to that in the, the description. Okay. So now here's a very different problem talking about a limit as x goes to infinity. Now, earlier in this video, I was talking about using this limit, the limit as theta approaches zero of sine of theta over theta equals one. And that is not what we have here, right? This, this limit is as x approaches infinity. So you can't use this here. And this particular limit is very tricky to analyze by itself because what it looks like is really I've got like infinity over infinity or something like that. So the way to work with this type of limit then is to use the sandwich theorem. So I just want to think about positive values of sine of x for right now. So what I'm going to do here is I, I know that sine of x, if we're just thinking about the positive values, and if I, so if I were to take the absolute value of this, um, I can really sandwich this between 0 and 1. And then to make this look like the limit that I have here, so I can divide everything by x to get this. And so I'm going to put absolute value around this just to kind of clarify this is going to stay positive. Okay, so from here, now I can go ahead and um, take some limits. So the limit as x approaches infinity of 0 is just going to be 0. And then the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x, we also know that this equals 0. So therefore, by the sandwich theorem then, this is also going to go to zero, so this will just equal zero. Okay, so there are three examples. I want to look at just a few more examples of just tricky things that can kind of come up with these limits as x approaches infinity. So one of my favorite tricky limits is this one right here. So this one, notice we have x approaching infinity, and I have these two square roots. And at first you might think, oh, it's just infinity, right? But it's a little subtle because really what you have here is this limit here is going to infinity, but this one here is going to negative infinity. So it's almost like the infinities are canceling themselves out. So it's kind of hard to say then where this is actually going. So with this particular limit, um, with, with this type of limit, what you have to use is the conjugate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this by the conjugate of, let's see, fit all this in here. So let's see, x plus 4 plus the square root of x plus 1. Now I can't just multiply one part of this by this. This kind of comes out of nowhere. 
I cannot change the overall value of the function. So instead what I do is I multiply this by this fraction of this square root of x plus 4 plus the square root of x plus 1. Because by multiplying by this fraction, this is really just like a value of 1. So I'm multiplying this by 1. So that does not technically change the value. But what's going to happen now is we're going to kind of multiply everything out. And then this is going to turn this problem into something we can work with. So let me multiply everything out. So now that I've multiplied everything and, and simplified, I can see that this problem here is equivalent to this. And so now I have this 3 over these two expressions with this is square root of x plus this other square root of x like expression. So this entire denominator is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so then what that tells me, since this whole denominator is going to infinity, the value of this entire expression is going to end up going to zero. So in the end, the answer here will be zero. Again, I have a lot more videos showing these types of examples if this is something that you want to see more of. So the last two types of limits as x approaches infinity that I want to discuss, I just wanted to compare these two here. So sometimes when you're working with these, you, you kind of just have to think through the details. There's not necessarily a, a great trick for it. It's just kind of thinking about the behavior of how things work. So for instance, with b here, I've got the limit as x approaches negative infinity of e to the x. So if you think about that, that is equivalent to really this. I can have this be the limit as x approaches infinity of e to the negative x. These two things are one and the same, but I think it's helpful to visualize like this because then what I can do is I can rewrite this as the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over e to the x. That's what it means to be a negative exponent. And so as x approaches infinity, this e to, you know, this x power, this is going to going to grow, the whole thing's going to grow, so the whole thing will end up going to zero. So this limit ends up equaling zero, but on the other side as x approaches infinity, well e is just a number, right? So this number, as it gets infinitely large, this is just going to get bigger and bigger. So in this case, this will just equal infinity. So sometimes when you're working with these, you kind of just have to like logically think through what makes sense. Now we still need to discuss infinite limits. And I'll just kind of quickly remind you here, your basic infinite limits. So starting with these two, I've got the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of 1 over x, and the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of 1 over x. So the first one is infinity, and the second one is negative infinity. And here's the graph of 1 over x, just to remind you of why that is. So here's here, here I am at, on the right side of 0, so I can see it's going to positive infinity. Here I am on the left side of 0, I can see it's going to negative infinity. So this is kind of just like a, a basic fact that you have to know. And one thing that kind of matters is, in this case, it, it really actually matters what's going on with some of the exponents here. So notice what happens now if I just square the top and the bottom. In this case now, both of these are going to equal positive infinity. And if you look at the graph, just for like a quick explanation of this, so you can see that on the left and the right, these are both going to positive infinity. So with these types of limits, it is very common to use a table. So we're going to take a look at this example, which I know is going to be an infinite limit. And I want to just make sure you understand why I, I know this is probably going to equal infinity. It, it will equal, either equal infinity or it won't exist. And I'll go into all that in a second. But I, I know that that's going to happen because take a look at this. I can't simplify this any farther. So this is very different from some of the stuff we were talking about earlier. So I just want to really quickly compare. This situation here, I cannot simplify this. There is nothing that I can do to simplify this. Versus this one, I could simplify this. So for either of these, if I wanted to evaluate the, the limit as x approaches 2 on the right, so notice here I'm going to have 1 over 0 if I were to just plug that in. In this case, I'm going to have 0 over 0, but I can also tell just by looking at this right away I could factor this, right? So this one I can factor. And so I'll have this x minus 2, x plus 2, and this is x minus 3 and x minus 2. And so you can see that you can cancel those out to get this limit, which then you can go ahead and just plug the, the 2 in. It doesn't even really matter that it's approaching from the right in this case. But with this other one, let's see, but with this other limit, 
we can't do that. So this is kind of like a distinction that this will probably end up being an infinite limit. So what I wanted to do is I just wanted to kind of briefly remind you of kind of how this works with the table and that that tends to be one of the more common ways to kind of analyze the behavior of these. So if I set up my table, so for this one, I want to choose some values that are just to the right of two. So just slightly bigger than two. So notice I start at 2.1 and then I start to get closer and closer to two on the right. And then um, let's see, I can go ahead and fill these in. So you can see kind of what's happening with the behavior here, but let, let's finish, let's finish this one. So coming over to this side, so if I just want to be on the left of two, so those would be values just below two. So now I'm going to choose 1.9, 1.99, 1.999. So notice I get closer and closer to two with each value. And if I evaluate these, I get these values here. So notice now the difference between kind of the, the two value sets. For two on the right, the closer I get to two, the larger my number gets. So the closer I get, this is just going to continue to grow and grow and grow. So this is going really into positive infinity versus with this one. Now on the left, the closer I get to two on the left, this is getting more and more negative. So this is going to negative infinity. So these answers then, this ends up being positive infinity versus negative infinity. And this is an important distinction because this is exactly the level of work that you have to go into if you wanted to show why this next limit does not exist. So this limit here, it might look just from the, the onset, if you had no other information, you might just say, oh, it's one over zero does not exist. Not true. So this does not exist, but you have to actually show why that is. And the way that you do that, it takes a lot of work to show a limit does not exist because ex what you'd have to do is you'd have to go through the work to show that this side equals infinity this side equals negative infinity. And so because these two sides differ, this implies then that this limit, this limit, the limit as x approaches two of one over x minus two, this does not exist because it approaches different values from the left and from the right. This is the way to show a limit does not exist. It is incorrect just to announce that it doesn't exist with no other proof. That is usually not going to get you very far in an exam. Now, one thing that happens as you get better with limits is you kind of get a little bit more finesse of, of what you're looking for. And so you can always create the table and you can always get a couple of values. So if I choose a couple of values as three gets closer, and, um, as we get closer to three on the right, th there are my values. And I can go ahead and plug these in. So I can see that this is going to equal infinity. But kind of an alternative way that you can think about this is you can just think about what happens with the behavior on the bottom. So as I'm on the right of three, so I'm going to square that value, whatever value is close to three, I'm going to square it. So this is going to be positive. This is going to be big and positive. And then if I'm on the right of three and I'm taking x minus three, this also ends up becoming positive. So the other common argument that comes up is people just think about the behavior of what's happening with kind of the calculations in the denominator. And I can see this is something positive times something positive. That's what I mean by this kind of thing here, what, what's happening here. So this is another way that people kind of think through this, but it kind of depends on your teacher and what your, what your teacher likes to see. So for me, if you kind of show me this type of argument, I will accept that um, as opposed to the table. But the table can always be a nice way just to double check your work. Okay, so moving on to this next limit. So this is a trig limit and I'll show you kind of a couple different ways you can think through this. So in my opinion, the easiest way to think through this is by knowing the graph of the tangent of X and really knowing that inside and out. So I've got the graph here. So if you know what the graph of the tangent of X actually looks like, you can pretty quickly figure this out. So I've got, um, let's see, my pi over two is gonna be like somewhere in here. So maybe I'll just mark it. So it's like somewhere, it's like somewhere through here. Um, so if I'm on the right side of pi over two, and I know how this graph works, so I can kind of use some of my knowledge of just how trig functions work to help me with this, to see that this is going to negative infinity. But if you're like me and you sometimes forget some of the details of the graphs, I'll show you just another way you can kind of think through this. So if I were to take a unit circle and I just think about tangent of x and this being um, sine of x over cosine of x. So 
I know that pi over two will give me a zero in the denominator. So I can tell that just by looking at that and knowing what I know about the unit circle. And by the way, for a calculus test, you should know the unit circle inside and outside. Like you, sh you should be able to write this on a test if you need to. So if you haven't memorized the unit circle, that is something that I would start quizzing yourself maybe every hour until you can do it from memory. It's not too bad to memorize it because really once you know that first quadrant, you know the rest. But it is something like when questions like this come up, if you know your unit circle inside and outside, it can, it can really help. Okay, so thinking about just the sine of x over cosine of x, I find the thing that really trips people up is they want to use the unit circle to finish to figure this out. And so sometimes what I'll notice is that people will think of pi over 2 and then try to go to the right of it. And that would be the wrong way to think about it. So I want you to just think about what does it mean to be on the right side of pi over 2? So from a graphical standpoint, that means slightly larger values than pi over 2. So values that are on the right of pi over 2, those would be like 2 pi over 3, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 6. So those are these values over here, right? So I might not know decimal values to get me very close to pi over 2, but I know what the behavior of my values are in this quadrant, right? So this is to the right of pi over 2, if you think about it from a graphical standpoint. So if I go back to this graph here, just real quick. So pi over 2, so values that are over on this side. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so if I just think about then what happens with kind of values over here, well, pi over 2 values on this side. So anything in here, what you're going to end up having is a negative cosine value and a positive sine value. So you have something positive divided by something negative. So if you think about it kind of from that standpoint, then the closer you get to pi over 2 on the right side of it, that's another reason why this will equal negative infinity, right? Because th that's kind of the way this has got to go. So that's kind of a, an, another route you can take if you forget the graph. So moving on to f here. So this one is actually like now putting everything together in some ways. So I've got the limit as x approaches 0 on the left of this graph. So what I need to think about first is just what happens to the limit as x approaches 0 on the left for 1 over x. So this we already talked about at the beginning of this video. This is equal to 1 over infinity. So this, this limit then, I'm, I'm really thinking about then, we don't write it out, but we think about what happens as really e is going to this negative infinity value. So we, we also talked about this, right? So I could rewrite this expression then to be the limit as x approaches negative infinity of e to the x. Those two things are one and the same. And this we already talked about, this we said is really just going to go to zero. So this kind of covers everything now. So now we have talked about limits, but let's just touch on a few ideas related to limits. So I specifically want to talk about continuous extensions and asymptotes. One thing I have not covered in this video is the precise definition of a limit. So that I cover in depth in some other videos. That one is a little bit hard to put into a summary. So if you are looking for some review on that, of course, you can find some links to that in my video description. So let's talk about continuous extensions. So what is a continuous extension? So this is determining a value that would make a function continuous. So an example of this would be something like, for what value of a is this function continuous? So to figure this out, you really have to use all of the information at your disposal. This is a piecewise function, and what you are looking to have happen is for overlap to occur at these two points here. So, um, or at the, at the value x equals 2. So first things first, I need to think about what's happening at x equals 2 for this function. So if I just think about that, I've got 2 squared plus, two, um, plus 1. So this equals 5. So what I want to have happen is both of these equal 5 at x equals 2. So if I want this to equal 5 when x equals 2, I need to plug in 2 for x. So I need to have 4 times a times 2. I want this to equal 5. So now look what happens. I still need to solve for a here. So this becomes 8a equals 5. And now I can easily solve for a. a is just going to equal 5 over 8. 
And so that would be the value of A that would make this continuous. Now sometimes you're going to be asked to actually plug that in. So that could be one other thing you might have to do with the problem. Now, the other thing I want to talk about are asymptotes. And we need to think about the calculus definitions of these concepts. One thing I notice in a lot of exams is that students will not think about the calculus version of this. They think about, oh, it's a line that you can't cross or whatever. But in a calculus test, you're going to want to use the calculus definition. And the calculus definition, so for a horizontal asymptote, it uses a limit. So you want to include then a limit in your answer if you're asked about horizontal asymptotes on a limits test. So a horizontal asymptote exists at y equals b if the limit as x approaches positive or negative infinity of f of x equals b. So really, it's evaluate the, the limit as x goes to infinity, and if it equals a number, then you have a horizontal asymptote there. And a vertical asymptote, so this is a function that uh, a function has a vertical asymptote at x equals a if one of these are true. So the limit as x approaches a on the left or on the right, if this equals infinity or negative infinity, then you have a vertical asymptote. So just to quickly show you kind of how you could use this, let's say I want to find the asymptotes of this particular function. So if I'm in a calculus test, then what I want to do is I want to just make sure that I am using the definitions. So here, this is what I would do then to find a horizontal asymptote. So in looking at this then, if I divide everything by x, this is going to equal 5 plus 1 over x and then 2 minus 4 over x. So these pieces here will go to 0 and this limit will equal 5 over 2. So what that means then is there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals 5 over 2. So that's me using the calculus definition for this. And I could do this again for negative infinity if I needed to. Now, for vertical asymptotes, that's really what you're looking for is where the denominator equals 0. So this equals 0 when, let's see, x equals 2. So if I take 2 times 2 minus 4, that'll give me a 0 in the denominator. So I kind of know, just from what I know about asymptotes, that this is where my asymptote should occur. But I need to use calculus to justify this now. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use a limit. So I'll take the limit as x approaches 2 on the right of my function. So 5x plus 1 over 2x minus 4. So let's just take a moment to focus on this. So now I just want to make sure I use some sort of limit technique to justify this. So if I wanted, I could make a table again. So I've got my values that are getting closer and closer to 2 on the right. So if I go ahead and evaluate that so I can see this is all going to positive infinity. So this whole thing is going to equal positive infinity. And so then what that means then is there is a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. This would be what justifies it. And then this is me using calculus to justify my answer. Whew. Okay. So that is it. So I know this was a bit of a longer video. So I'm curious to know if you actually made it to the end. If you made it to the end, um, leave me a comment. I am so curious to know what you think. I have more videos where you can actually now study limits with me. Um, they're called Study with a Math Professor. I'll drop some links to them in the description. Otherwise, thanks for watching, guys. I really do appreciate it. And if this was helpful to you, please let me know if I should continue making videos like this. All right, guys, I'll catch you next time.